in a world where everything goes, like you don't have to show up on time because there's time blindness, where you don't have to actually wear professional outfits because somebody's going to tell you your leather strap BDSM outfit, these are real stories, um, are fine and work appropriate. In a world where you can literally just redefine everything based on, I got a gold star my whole life, so I don't have to comply with the world standards, we want to address that. If you're a business owner, if you are a human being, if you are a coworker, if you're in high school, college, or in the professional world, and you're having to deal with this, we thought it would be really fun and entertaining and also kind of a little bit sad and real to talk about where our culture is right now and things we can do practically to be different from the culture, really stand out and be the ones that influence for positive change. So all over social media and in our personal lives, we know people that are saying things like, of course I can't be on time. I have ADHD or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we as a culture have worn our disabilities as a badge of honor and we should the world should bend to our will I saw like a TikTok the other day that said yeah I have ADHD so why am I being punished for being 15 minutes late for work because that's I just can't figure out when to be on time and it's a really hard world to live in yeah yeah I think the gold star for everything participation award has really dumbed down the standards. And we're saying, you know, even in universities where you expect it to be really hard, to be honest, as a professor, it's hard to have to actually be someone who holds standards because they're so used to going around you and being like, well, Dean, uh, I got accommodations for this other thing over here. And I understand accommodations. Like we all have something that we're working through. But to the point that it's, I shouldn't be held to normal standards because I'm so used to working the system. That's a frightening world because as a business owner, I know what that's like. And then if you have coworkers that sometimes you're showing up like three hours late, Yes. How does that impact other people? Absolutely. Yeah. There's just a uh, culture we've created today where young people have this stereotype that we're not hard workers or we're not driven. And it's because we haven't been held to any sort of standards. So when we enter the workforce and we show up three hours late and someone's opening a coffee shop, say, by themselves and running the whole thing, we don't really issue apologies or make an effort to be there on time next time because everything worked out and everything was okay. And so it's a hard world to put in when their sacrifice is made so your standards can be met where you're at. Mm -hmm. You being 15 minutes late is okay. Other people are making sacrifices for you to be able to do that as well. Exactly. It's literally like, it's not time blindness. It's the empathy lacking of like being aware that my choices impact others. So when we're thinking about this at Crawford Clinics and we're helping people in their career and how to be the top of the top, for us, you are one of our leading Gen Z coach counselors, right? Like I just adore you. And I would have never known the disabilities and all the things you grew up with. So what helps you to be always early, always professional, always a go above and beyond? Like as an employer, you are a delight. So if you want to have somebody that like works well, Claire would be a good example. Also, if you want to be someone that your boss is like, hey, you are dependable, reliable, you are our pinnacle. Not that I don't also love everybody else, but you are incredible. How have you done that when I know some of your background that that didn't come natural? Yeah. When I was really young, I was diagnosed with ADHD with a slew of other learning disabilities. And oftentimes we can take those as a badge of honor. And now the world has to accommodate for us. But during my education, I was taught that this was a thing that I had to account for in Mm -hmm. my time. This was something that I had to overcome and work with. It makes my mind beautiful and creative and different, but also the standard that the world is set in is not going to bend to my will. So I need to kind of change and go with the flow. And so for me to be able to show up on time and uh, be intentional and kind of be focused takes an amount of effort that has slowly built to be effortless. Mm -hmm. So when I was younger, I would make sure that if I needed to be somewhere the next morning, I'm making safeguards. I'm setting multiple alarms. I'm writing reminders on the back of my hand at that point in time. I'm um, mapping out how long it takes me to get somewhere. I'm time blocking. Those things are things that I do days in advance or or like the night in advance of when I need to be somewhere so that I'm really prepared and always aware of my surroundings. Mm, that's so good. 
Yeah. So odds are good. Like we in our family, we were like, we're not going to test Shannon, <laughs> good or bad. Yeah. Uh, but I probably have a ton of learning disabilities. I know we have dyslexia in our family. I know that there's probably some attention issues. I'm so grateful that I didn't have a world around me that said that's an excuse. That was an invitation to learn compensation strategies. Mm -hmm. So having to learn how to work harder or keep a dictionary nearby yeah. or how to have extra alarm clocks. Or I still, to this day, as a CEO, I still write on the back of my hand unapologetically mm -hmm. because if it's really important, I have like six lists and one of those is going to remind me at the right time to do it. And so I think that creates such self-responsibility. Mm -hmm. And the problem with our world right now is it's external locus of control, which means the responsibility is on the world to adjust to me which is a very narcissistic orientation in life, that the world should bend to me, you guys should be about me, versus actually this is the world and to be a good steward, to be the best, to be excellent, how do I develop compensation strategies so that I can serve well, I can love well, I can show up the best version for other people mm -hmm. so that like to your point, they're not three hours late and then everybody else has to like compensate for you and your mess and disaster. So when we learn that and we have an internal locus of control, which just means center. On the inside of me, I take responsibility. I'm not asking the world to give me 12 different diagnoses and labels, nothing against those, but I'm not asking for them to have to change the world for me. So knowing you today uh -huh. without knowing your background, I am constantly inviting you to more challenging things and, and probably under preparing you for certain things because you come across very professional, very competent, you show up on time, you lead with a internal confidence mm -hmm. that's very attractive to the world in a non-sexual way in like a human, yeah. people like you with. Yeah. So what do you think helped you develop that when you did start with so many disadvantages? Um, I think, honestly, just, uh, false sense of confidence at first. I mean, like you- Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. When I was in school, um, I'm thinking about like the, I went to a school that taught me at, like learning disabilities were creative and different. And these are the things mm -hmm. you needed to put in place. And you are need to be an advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't look like people bending to your will, but you need to be able to assert yourself and be confident. So when yes. I moved to public school, I attended my first 504 meeting for my, uh, I was in the entering the sixth grade, and that's like a meeting full of adults. Yes. And I sat there and told them what I struggled with, what I needed, and what I could do. And we had like a conversation. Now it was heartbreaking at some points, but what was it, heartbreaking? Oh, the, just like realizing what a disability is, because oh. 504 is for anyone with disabilities. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, there's there's people who can't go to the bathroom by themselves. Oh. That's a part of 504. So it was heartbreaking at some points, but sure. I think from a really young age, I was forced to be a leader for myself, mm -hmm. um, like walking up to teachers and having to assert myself and mm -hmm. um, ask for things that I needed, but also like compromise and work hard. So I don't know. I think that that's a lot of... And just like a willingness to be uncomfortable. Yes, to be stretched. Yeah. Which has been a lot of... Yeah, just a, a, a high... My, Chase calls it a high tolerance for discomfort. Mm. And if we don't force people that we love to be uncomfortable, there's no growth. Yeah. You know, just like with your muscles and their growing pains, physically, if we always enable, we always rescue, even as a parent or as a society or as a teacher, mm -hmm. and we don't hold people accountable. I remember in some semesters when students would actually say, thank you, Dr. Crawford, for giving me feedback hard feedback because yeah. most people throughout my life have always just been like, good work, good work, A, A, A. But I don't really feel like I know the material. I feel like I'm just getting passed along through a system mm -hmm. instead of genuinely invested into. And I love this balance you're talking about because we can always fall into a ditch. Mm -hmm. One is I keep my mouth shut and I don't advocate for myself at all mm -hmm. and just expect that my grit should be enough. On the other side, it's this very whiny, entitled, the world should bend to me and I shouldn't ever have a consequence for being 15 to 30 minutes late. You know, mm -hmm. that's not real life. But somewhere in the middle, you're developing this healthy confidence in the appropriate settings to stand up for yourself, to let people know your needs, mm -hmm. and then they respond to that. 
Because if you were always flaky and it was hard to depend on you to begin with, and then you wanted me to bend to you, mm -hmm. very likely you would not be a part of us, yeah. right? Yeah. But because you show up with such confidence and excellence that if you were to ask me for an adjustment, I'm, I'm glad to do that mm -hmm. because there's equity. Yeah. And I think that's what we're not seeing in society is that you're not necessarily teaching people when I ask for an accommodation, I should also show up in a way that's meaningful and providing mutual mm -hmm. edification, blessing. If it's a boss, then I should be showing them I care about your business, not just you should just let me do whatever I want because I have this badge. But there's a mutual respect that I think is really endearing. Yeah, absolutely. I think that as I've walked through life, it's there are things that naturally are hard for me. Like there's moments where I'm maybe a little scatterbrained mm -hmm. or whatever, or um, I'm maybe not like as clear spoken because sometimes it's hard to get, you know, I got a lot going on up here. Words it's hard to, to get bath. it out here. Yeah. And so it's always been really important for me to be supportive and communicative with people. And I learned that from a young age, being relational and open was the best way to receive help and also to help others. And so I think that that's been a real part of my success because like there's been a lot of fake it till you make it till you get here. Like I mm -hmm. didn't always do well in school. Um, I Same. am not always the most like focused or driven person. Mm -hmm. I have days where I get into doom scrolls and procrastinate, but picking yourself back up and being able to really like overcome and be uncomfortable yeah. and being okay with being uncomfortable yeah. is a big part of being successful. And the last thing I'm hearing that I want to undercore, undercore, mm, underscore is resilience. So we all fall. We all have hard days. We feel bad. Why can't I do it as well as somebody else, et cetera? But I hear this resilience in you. What do you think helped build that? Um, Just failing a lot and it, you know, being okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, being able to, I don't know, fall down, mess up, be uncomfortable and witness the growth in myself mm. through falling down. Yes. Like you always should try your best and put your best foot forward. Um, because even when you fail in that situation, you've known you've done the most you can, and then you've learned something. Yeah. So just really restructuring the way that you think about failure and mm -hmm. it as an opportunity for change and development. Yeah. I got my first ticket the other day and the whole time, instead of thinking, oh my gosh, this stinks. I hate that I have a ticket. I was able to have a more positive experience with my ticket because I thought, okay, well, what did I learn from this? Mm -hmm. Who did I meet? Mm -hmm. What did I, what knowledge did I gather to pass on later? Mm -hmm. And how can I improve moving forward? And those are kind of my mindsets with like struggles now is- That's your growth mindset. Yeah. It's been really wonderful because usually I would have a little meltdown, meltdown <laughs> about a ticket because that's so inconvenient, so painful, but because I have support in my life and I find that those opportunities can foster so much growth. Yeah, I would say even for me in grad school, because my whole life I had to be in tutoring, I wasn't diagnosed probably as dyslexia, let's be honest, but I wasn't diagnosed. So I always had to be in tutoring that by the time I got to grad school, I was the only person, I was 21 years old in a doctorate program. So can you imagine the stakes? Like yeah. it's so serious, all these people are so smart and I know that I'm called to do this and I know that I care about people, but the whole academic part was super overwhelming. I'm the only one that failed the first exam in grad school. The only one in my whole cohort. The only one. And my professor sat me down. He's like, you know, I think you could, I think you could still make it in grad school. Like so concerned as if I was a type A, like neurotic person. I'm like, oh, I failed lots of things. I'll just get more tutoring. I'll just work harder. Like it didn't even dawn on me that I wouldn't finish the program because failure had so prepared me to have to be resilient, to have to troubleshoot back to your point of yeah. like, yep, like part and parcel in life. And so I think one of the worst things that happen in society is we don't want kids to have low self-esteem, so we won't give them bad grades. We'll give them stars because in essence, as a society, you are putting their self-esteem with their performance. 
That was literally the worst thing I think that we could have done. Mm -hmm. And I've been asked, like, why do you think we have so much narcissism? Why do we have so much uh, fa fear of failure and inactive, like kids not getting their driver's license? Why are these things happening? I think a lot of it is because as a society, as a school system, we tied their performance with their identity and their self-esteem. When we can fail forward and then troubleshoot, figure out, learn, and do that, and that becomes normal, and then I'm told every day by my parents, we love you, God loves you, you're valuable, we don't care what grade you get as long as you're working really hard and we see you going to tutoring, we, we're championing you and we're getting those resources. And you know, my brother was very dyslexic, so my mom really investing in him, taking his tests for, well, not taking it for him, reading his tests for him. So there were accommodations being met, the family leaned in, in. all of those strategies took the self-esteem out of the grade. And I think that's why when everybody else in grad school passed the first exam, they could kind of float by a little bit more. I pressed in. I got tutoring and I worked the hardest. I got the highest grade at the end of grad school. The accumulation of all of your doctorate program, I got the highest, not because I'm the smartest, but because I have a work ethic that wasn't tied to self-esteem. So as you're listening and maybe you're even thinking of somebody else, we wanna send encouragement to you that your self-esteem, your worth, your value is not tied to your performance. I know we all know that, but when that sinks inside and you know that you are valuable and you may have to develop compensation strategies, you may have to set multiple alarms, you may have to go to tutoring, you may have to do that, those are the ingredients that make the most successful people. Because I was 26 getting a doctorate not because I'm the smartest, but because I know what it feels like to fail. Failing sucks, so I work really, really hard so I don't have to feel that again. I didn't have somebody else do that accommodation. I didn't cry to society and say, oh man, I have these learning disabilities. But when you get it inside of you and you believe in yourself and you say, this obstacle, this failure is an invitation to troubleshoot, to figure out how this obstacle that everyone else is gonna back down or they're gonna take it lazy, easy street, then you're the one that moves through that obstacle, you're set apart. Like we get so many interviews at Crawford Clinics of people wanting to work at our clinic. I can tell you a lot of people we don't choose to bring on our team because we choose really great people who have high internal value, respect, motivation, like Claire. So that's why I wanted her to be our guest today because it's not to the swift and the talented and the smartest, it's to the people that on the inside have learned how to have grit, have learned how to overcome some really unfair, unjust, sucky things in life, and yet you've pushed through that. I want you to know we applaud you. And we're also here to help you in your career, in your relationships, and in your academic needs. If you need study strategies, if you need somebody to help you in career counseling and figure out what your next steps are, or how to overcome that fear of failure that immobilizes you, or your kid that's not getting their driver's license because it's like, what's keeping me from moving forward? We would love to be a resource for you at CrawfordClinics.com so that you get to remove that glass ceiling and really embark on the life that you're designed for. We'll see you for the next episode. Bye guys.